right, so um, thanks again for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk a bit about field geology and, and specifically mapping. So uh, just briefly, what, what I thought would be a good way to look at it, just a little bit of background on myself, on uh, Mineral, the company I'm working for as a consulting company, and then just basically the essence of mapping from your digital side, when you look at things from a regional scale, um, like the remote sensing, I guess the ultimate form of remote sensing when you're looking interplanetary, um, down to when you're actually physically on the ground, and then when you're under the ground, um, what, what can you be mapping and, and what will you look at if you go into that. So briefly, myself, I studied at uh, Foners. I didn't go through to a master's, my objective was to get working as soon as I could. Um, and uh, although it worked out all right for me, I think uh, career-wise, um, if I were recommending to people who are studying, I would say probably worth going through to your master's, specifically for international work. I think a uh, uh, master's is a lot more recognized um, internationally, and so I, I would suggest that, although it's not required. Um, so currently, I'm working uh, as a resource geologist at Mineral Consulting. I look after the companies, all the geological modeling and the GIS and the map make, um, resulting from that. And, and how I got there was I actually started off mapping. I started off with the basic exploration, going out in the field and um, mapping out geological units, constructing geological maps, taking samples, started working on drilling programs. And, and basically I've worked throughout almost all the static, well, all the static countries and most of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. I've worked on a few projects elsewhere, up uh, Saudi Arabia, a um, little bit North Tanzania, Nigeria, um, and then that's places I've been physically. Um, so the essence of it is when you're a geologist, you're gonna travel. I think that's the essence of an exploration geologist. And especially if you're mapping, you need to be um, at sites. You need to be physically on the ground in the place you're mapping unless you're doing some kind of remote sensing or, or GIS work. So the essence of what I wanted to highlight was that my background in physical mapping and exploration, I feel has contributed greatly towards my resource geology um, attributes. And it's really just a case of when you fundamentally understand a lot about firstly, how mapping is done, what processes people go through, what assumptions are made, um, you're able to, if you understand the process, when you're working with that data later, you're able to work with it better. You're able to make better judgments from it, understand it better, and ultimately it helps you. And, and I think mapping, as all of the talks even so far and, and in, in other career show days have showed, is a basic geological function. If you want to be a geologist in any sense, you need to know and understand how to, how to do some mapping. You can also specialize it, and I'll talk about that a little bit at the end, you can become a specialist in geological mapping. All right, a little bit about the company I'm currently working for. Obviously, we do geological mapping. We focus on exploration. Um, so we have an exploration department. We also do a lot of mining related, hydrology, and then, and then we have our training programs. And when we have a list of our services there. The very first one starts off with geological desktop studies. And then we go into the remote sensing and geological mapping. So, so really, it's one of those fundamental processes um, that you would have to um, do in order to understand um, a deposit. Mapping is, is, is a core to that. We'll look at it also just briefly is um, mapping doesn't end just when you're doing prospecting or the basic um, mineral uh, exploration. But it also, mapping is an integral part of when we're mining. It's not like we stop, we carry on while we're mining. Um, and that, that is, can be an avenue that I think a lot of maybe graduates might end up doing is going, if you end up working for a mine, it's almost guaranteed you're going to be doing some face mapping, some stoke mapping, depending on, on where and how you're working. So this is our company. Um, we're about 16 people now. That's the essence of our team, as you can see from the map there. Um, We've worked extensively in Africa, Southern Africa, um, and then a few other countries around, uh, around the world, and a host of commodities. And that's really something that you will start to understand in your geological career, 
is that old saying of the geologist who's seen the most is probably the best geologist is, is kind of true because if you've worked on a lot of deposits, if you've seen a lot of exposures in our previous talk as well, we saw that, you have that background information to draw on when you're looking at new settings, you're looking at new scenarios. Um, so, so really mapping is one of those careers where you can get a lot of cross industry and um, cross commodity exposure. So what, what really is geological mapping? What does it entail? Well, as you can see in these pictures here, it involves a lot of being in the field. You're gonna be in different terrains. You're gonna be in different environments, whether it's from dry arid places like Namibia near Baitas. In South Africa, we have also some very hilly terrains or up into small central Africa. And people tend to get scared when they think of being out in the middle of the bush. But if, if you're someone who enjoys adventure, Mapping is definitely going to be one of those professions for you because all of these pictures I've taken, I took myself. I have hard drives full of pictures of scenery um, out in Congo bush, um, Uganda, across Africa, really. So you're going to be going to these places, and the objective is for you to do that very um, essential baseline data gathering. And you are there to try and turn the unquantifiable things, you just look at a picture, you have no quantities to attach to that into something quantifiable. So you are trying to identify the geology, the structures, whatever aspect you're trying to map out, your job is to do that fundamental data gathering. So where do we start? Well, as mentioned, most of the time, you're gonna start behind a computer and you're going to look at all those open source bits of information that you can get. And uh, you're going to be gathering probably something along the lines of uh, Landsat image. And uh, you can start working with that to understand the geology that you want to map out. Um, I just gave an example here. You can use some of the different bands um, in, the room, in the electromagnetic spectrum that you get from uh, Landsat satellite imagery. This is all free and open source. You can start playing around with those bands, putting a few different combinations together and you get what's called a false color image like in the little red picture in the middle there and really what that's showing you is that different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum you get different geological information that can come out some rock types might show a different color to another and you can maybe start seeing things that with the the, the, the naked eye a natural image you wouldn't be able to easily identify you can start seeing things like faults. These fault structures are clearly identified by vegetation um, in this particular case. So mapping out the vegetation can give you an idea of how the faults work. It can get more complicated. You can start looking at um, band ratios where you take, say, a band seven and a band six, you divide the two numbers by each other, and then you plot that. Um, so there's a lot of work that can go into remotely understanding the geology. Then you get to actually going into the field. So we want to prep ourselves. As any geologist will know, you need maybe not a lot, but there are some keys um, in your field equipment, your compass, a hand lens, nowadays a, a GPS, a hammer, maybe some base maps, a book to take notes in. All of these are going to be, if you were in the mapping field, this is going to be your, your essentials. So now you want to know what are we mapping? How are we going to map it? And, and, and where are we going to? And essentially, that really depends on the objective. If you're going into an area and you want to get some overall insights, what you map and how you map it will be different than if you're trying to get locate some mineral sea resources. You're trying to identify a target area. So really, the objective of your mapping dictates a lot about how you're going to do it. I'll give you an example there of what you're going to map. So for instance, I've got four examples of things that you can map. You can look at the lithologies, you can be mapping the structures, you can be mapping um, fossil records, so you're looking for relative dating of, of, of lithologies, or you can be doing some geochemical mapping. It depends on what you're trying to do. So this is an example of maybe you're looking at some lithological contacts. What you're trying to map out are the different rock types. So that's sort of a map you would have. Or, as you saw on the map, there were some details. Some of those details are structural features. 
So in the pictures here, you can see taking a, a compass, um, you're able to map out the dip and the strike, how these rock units are sitting in the ground, and you're able to use those structural features to plot it on a map and make interpretations. And what are the interpretations you would make? Well, you're probably going to start working out what actually happened in this area. What rock units were, for instance, thrust up or folded or faulted, and, and what happened? And you, would, you would produce something like this in the image, where you, you're reconstructing what happened to those, those rocks. Maybe you're looking at the fossil records. You're trying to identify associated with a specific, uh, maybe a reducing um, mythological type, rock type, um, a carbon unit. So you want to map out where these things are. So you would be looking at some detailed structural um, sedimentary logs or, um, for the rock types. Maybe that's what you're interested in. Or you're looking at some geochemistry. You're doing some soil samples. You're doing some ionic sampling. Something in which you're trying to identify where the uh, commodity is of interest is before you start doing some more detailed either trenching or drilling. So this is an example of a map here. We were looking for uh, uh, tantalum, coltan. And so we did some soil sampling to identify where were these mineralized pegmatites that we were looking for. So that, that's the what we can look at when we're mapping. But there's also different methods, the how. And that depends on the scale that you're working. So we could be looking at a national scale. You could be trying to map out a country. Um, most countries have already got a geological map um, associated with it. And so then you would be looking very big scale. You'd only be looking at grouping together groups of, of, of rock types. Maybe that's what you're mapping. Or zooming in a little bit, you're looking more on a regional scale. This is a one is to 250,000 map. And uh, any geologist who starts out working is going to start getting real familiar with these type of maps because they're the basis. Um, if they're available in the country you're working, it's the basis from where you're going to go. This is the rock type or the group of rocks or formation that we're looking at. What am I going to add to this? What more detail are we going to, to add to this map? More on a local scale, maybe then you're not, you're not looking at um, remote sensing. Now you're physically on site. You can't walk and map out everything. So you do some traverse lines to try and identify what the geology is along a line. And then you stitch together and interpret what's happening between those lines. Going in a little more detailed, maybe you're looking at a, an outcrop map. So you're going to go into a specific area and you have enough time to go to every single outcrop, delineate exactly the shape of that outcrop, and then some features about it. An even more ver detailed version of an outcrop map, some kind of grid mapping. Where on every single one of those square blocks, those grids, you map out every single geological feature you can find. I'll just give me an example of how detailed this map actually is. Zoom in on one of those things and you see every contact has been mapped out. Every unit has a dip and a strike. Any fence that comes across that grid was mapped out so that you have a very detailed geological map. And what's the intention behind these maps? You probably want to use it. So you're going to take your surface, your 2D map, and turn it into some kind of 3D model um, of, of what's happening there. So you can make projections. I mean, that's really one of the purposes of maps. We map out what we can see so we can make some kind of interpretation. Moving a little bit into the more operations. Previously, we were sort of looking at when you don't know much about an area. But maybe you're working a little bit more in a, in a mining area. You're going to, again, you're going to want that detail because you take one of those areas, you map everything in it, and you start getting a much more detailed picture of what the geology is doing. And, and of course, in a mining environment, that's essential. You need as much detail as you can because you're trying to mine it. So just as a brief recap, as a mapping geologist, what are you going to be doing? Well, you're probably going to look at satellite images. You're probably going to do some kind of traverse mapping, depending on the scale of the project you're looking at. And traverses are when you walk lines perpendicular to the geology. You may be looking at some contacts, and that's when you walk along and map out, trace out the geological contact, or whatever it is you're trying to trace out. Maybe it's a structural feature you're trying to map out. You might look at um, outcrops. And then there's other things you can look at. You can, you can look at um, topographical features. And the basic concept in that in mapping is that 
Topography is dictated by the underlying geology. If you have a very hard, resistant rock type, it's going to form a hill because uh, it didn't weather that well. So the topography is going to show you what the geology is doing. River systems, drainage systems, they can also start telling you what the geology is doing. And then my favorite form of geology, not that you get to do it too much, is the drive-by type of geology. You get to look out the window of the car and look at the vegetation or the soils or the hillside and make some inferences about what the geology is doing. Typically, like an example, if you're driving through Barberton area in South Africa, you're going to see a lot of um, cacti. And as soon as you start seeing a cluster of cactuses on top of a hillside, a very prominent sticking out feature, almost guaranteed that's a dike. Because those particular cacti in that region, they love the um, magnesium in the soil that comes from a, um, a, a dike. So you can start making um, inferences from other features, not just the geology. Obviously then, if you're looking at surface maps, we've spoken about plans, maps, that's typically what we think of, but that, that's not necessarily what the geology is doing. Just because you're looking at a plan map doesn't mean that uh, that's exactly what's going on. We always need to remember that geology is in three dimensions. So a map can be uh, a plan view, but it can also be a section. view, And that's sort of what you're seeing in some of these pictures here where you had, um, a, it's a photo. We're basically looking at a section and you're mapping out the geology on that. So that's the type of thing that you would be doing. And, and that, that leads us quite nicely into what you would do if you were mapping on a mine. And I'll show you in a moment that that's in essence what you need to map out these 2D sections so that you can combine it to make the 3D interpretations. And that is a key point of, of a mapping geologist's life is although you are collecting primary data, there always needs to be a distinction between the actual data and your interpretation of that data. And that, that's a key to being a good geologist because as, if you put 10 geologists in a room and ask them to come up with a different geologic or ask them to come up with a geological interpretation, odds are you'll have 10 different interpretations. And that's just because there's a lot of uncertainty when you're a geologist. And especially on the mapping phase, you probably have very limited data. So we need to make interpretations. And so you should always keep that distinction between what's a physical recorded data and what is an interpretation. And that becomes important, as I said, when you're working in a mine environment, because now you've got a lot more information so you need to map out exactly what's there. So in a mine environment, what are the types of mapping you would be doing? Well, you're probably gonna either be working on an open cast mine, that's a big pit. You just dig into the, into the ground and get some very big pits. Or you would be working underground in, in shafts and drives, um, underground environment. And both of those require some kind of mapping. And actually, at least in South Africa, but most mining, legislation um, around the world dictate that you need to do mapping. And although there's an economic interest to the company, they want to understand the geology better, there's a safety aspect as well. And that's why it's a legal requirement that mines do mapping. Because if you're looking at a, a stoke wall where you've mined and you start seeing that the rocks are moving, there's a fracture forming, and you're mapping that out, you could potentially be saving people's lives when that is analyzed and it seems like actually this is an unsafe working space because you're going to have a rock fall or you're going to have a rock collapse. So mapping can be very important, not only for economic, but it can also be important from a safety aspect. So what are some examples? Well, I'll show you. That's an open cast mine. You can see very clear that's in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And what would you be mapping? Well, you'd be trying to map out the geology. So you would be trying to map out the features that are shown in that image. How do you do that? Well, you look at the wall that's right in front of you and you start mapping out what the geology is doing. This, in the, this example is a, it's a chrome mine and they're mapping out the, the chrome seams. Maybe you're in an underground environment. What does that typical mapping look like if you're working there? Well, this will be a, um, a haulage map. Um, and uh, essentially what you're looking at there is the middle little column the middle um, area that's a little bit white and doesn't have too many details on, that's the floor. And on either side of it, that's the, the walls on either side, just plotted as a plan. So if you folded this image up, you'd be able to look exactly 
what this tunnel looks like. And you're mapping the wall and the floor of the tunnel. You do on reef development. Well, now you're mapping what the where the mining is actually happening, say the coal seam or the, the chrome seam that you're trying to mine, you're mapping as they mine what how that changes, what the geology looks like, where that seam is moving to, how thick is it. The last type of mapping you'd be doing underground are your white spin mine. So if you're going into a career in geological mapping, as we said at the outset, first thing you need to do is you need to understand geological maps. You need to understand how to create them. You need to understand what they're used for. And only that way will you be an effective geological map. You also need to understand that as technology progresses, we used to do a lot of mapping on paper and nothing wrong with mapping on paper, but technology is moving towards being able to do a lot more computer processing. And so inevitably, even if you map something out on using pencil and paper, you're going to have to turn it into a digital version so that we can start working it maybe in a more 3D or do a lot more computer processing with it. So here's an example of a good old paper map. Uh, might not look like a lot of detail, but these type of maps took years for geologists to map out. Um, you can see on the bottom right there, there's a whole lot of signatures. That's every single year, the signature of the surveyor and the geologist who mapped out this particular mine. And if you look you zoom in on one little area, you can just see in this one section, you can see um, the detail that went into getting exactly where these shafts were, exactly where the, the mined out areas were, um, the, the peg locations, the dates, and everything was mined, a lot of detail. But inevitably, we need to turn that into something digital. So you're going to take your geological section, for instance, your geological map, and you're going to combine it with the surface map maybe in a 3D environment. This is an example of where we literally took historical sections and a plan and georeferenced them into 3D so that we could make a 3D geological model of it and actually see what was going on in three dimensions. So that's what your typical mapping is used for. But always remember that you are that primary data collection. So you're gonna be the guy who gets the data. So it doesn't matter how good the interpretations are that come afterwards. If you didn't collect good data, if your geological maps aren't good, no matter how clever the person is who's doing work after you or whatever they're doing, they can do the best job in the world. They're going to do it on bad data. So it's going to be a garbage result, as they say, garbage in and garbage out. Always good to remember. Um, typically, I think in industry, it's <laughs> even in, uh, as geologists, we, uh, we tend to think in levels. So you start out as a junior geologist or a geologist in training, then you become a junior geologist and you're a geologist, senior geologist, and you're sort of working your way up the ladder. But sometimes it's good to remember that that doesn't necessarily mean if you're a manager that uh, you know, you're the most highly paid person in the company. See, sometimes it's good to remember that you get specialists, specialists in different fields. You can have a specialist in geological mapping and they are very good at what they do. They are able to collect all the primary data that you need and in a form that makes it enable you to be able to work with all of this later. The same thing happens with core logging. Core logging is one of those primary geological functions. You're interpreting what's happening in the data uh, or you're interpreting what's happening in the core and turning that into data that someone else can process. So actually, you need your most skilled and most intelligent people doing that task, because if they get it wrong, everything that comes afterwards is wrong. So you do get specialists in that. You do get specialists um, in core logging and, and GIS, which is geographical information systems, is the general term, all map-related stuff, specifically in the uh, digital space.